Hello, uh, this is Tom Padula from Tom Padula TV on YouTube and Insegna Booksellers. And uh, here I am, uh, it's a Sunday afternoon, it's a bit bleak outside, a bit cold. So I thought um, I'd do this history uh, podcast, a lesson, presentation, whatever we want to call it. Uh, and uh, it continues um, from uh, uh, lesson number 66 which was the first one of series two of world history and uh, today is the uh, the ninth sunday uh, the 9th of um, of july 2023 uh, and uh, it's uh, as i said it's program number 67 okay so that, that's the that's the intro for in terms of the dates and times, because um, as you know, I don't come on at a particular time anymore. I just come on whenever I feel like it and uh, I've got time to do something and I'll do this uh, with great pleasure. Of course, world history is one of my uh, favourite uh, subjects uh, in that I want to know more and more about the world and uh, its history from uh, the very beginning to, to now, trying to understand what is going on in the world today. Well, can I say this? There's nothing new. There have been wars and uh, misunderstandings uh, forever. It's just the nature of us. Uh, some nations become greedy. Uh, some individuals are greedy. So it sort of uh, extends to the community as a whole. What we were trying to do now is to actually look into the universe and say, well, there's a lot more out there in the universe to explore. So why do we have to fight amongst ourselves? That's an important consideration. And uh, also some people say, oh, well, you know, we haven't resolved all the problems of the world. So... Why should we bother about the universe? Well, the reality is that we do need to always have uh, this idea of a expansion into the unknown uh, in order to keep us uh, focused on uh, something that we need to do. It's, uh, we are by nature, really, uh, quite adventurous. Uh, the danger is when we are not so. So stay static, and uh, I suppose there is a balance to be to be made. It's the balance is important. If we can uh, balance our work with other people, in other words, we we, we cooperate then we can be in peace. And uh, I think uh, in Australia, at least, uh, we have known such beautiful peace uh, because of uh, the acceptance of uh, the diversity amongst ourselves, the new policies whereby we, uh, we accept diversity and we say we are united in our diversities. So we respect each other and uh, we, you know, different groups are supposed to respect uh, have respect amongst themselves. Interesting. Now, I want to show you the the journeys of exploration and commerce because that's where we're at at the moment. We're exploring. So here we go. There. This is where in the 15th century, 1400s, people travelled. See that? From... Europe from this little, that little, it, in terms of the world, Europe is not very big at all, but it has had a tremendous influence in terms of uh, the history because, uh, you know, the, the five, uh, uh, the, before, before the exploration voyages, uh, the centre was the Mediterranean Sea here, the Roman Empire, uh, this part here. But after, because of problems going from there to, to here for trade into India, let's say, for spices, they said, well, if that's the case, we're not gonna, we're gonna, we have problems here because the Turks 
you know, the Turkish Empire there, it was imposing taxes, we're going to go around. And that's in order to get to India. And by mistake, Columbus, he thought, I'll go this way. <laughs> and he ended up somewhere else. So, and then eventually, of course, all this area here gets uh, looked at by the, the Spaniards and the Pope, who's in Rome, said to the Portuguese and the Spanish uh, people, you can have all of that. And then the, the English, the French, the Dutch, they were left out sort of thing, but they were pretty powerful. And uh, eventually they, they fought amongst each other for domination of the lands that they were occupying. But there were people there already, so <laughs> uh, interesting. And eventually we get to Australia, but not yet. Okay, so that's, that's it. This is it. This is our world. There you are. Apart from the South Pole and North Pole, which are not habitable, really, large, by large numbers of people, here we go. Okay, so here I am again. And I think my, I've done my five minutes of presentation there. I'll, go, I'll, I'll start straight away into uh, new business techniques as a result of the discoveries, okay? So, before I do anything else, I must have a drink. No. Okay. New business techniques. So, let's have a look at what happened. The early capitalistic system of production, especially in the textile industries, is called the putting out system. The merchant prince purchased raw material, such as wool, and delivered it to homes that he had equipped with spinning wheels and looms. Here, the spinners and weavers worked in their spare time to produce yarn and cloth which the merchant collected and sold. Thus, the merchant could expand his business almost limitlessly by using his profits to buy more raw material and machines, to put out in more and more homes. So in other words, trade, production and trade. Exceptionally capable and ruthless individuals like Jacques Coeur were able to amass a fortune, purchase merchant fleets and own warehouses. But most individuals could never accumulate enough to buy a ship or a bank. This gave rise to a business enterprise which was a forerunner of the present corporation, the Joint Stock Company, in which various investors pooled their capital to accumulate enough money to finance overseas expeditions and to become commercial giants. Each investor received a share of the annual profits as a return on his investment, and he was free to sell his share or stock in the enterprise to another investor. So that's the way our companies work today. So if you, you know, if you, if you got uh, some cash and you want to invest it, you come, you know, you haven't got the, well, you've got to have capital. Once you get capital, then you distribute to wherever you, 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 wherever you, you, you want to. And the reality is that when you distribute uh, the money, sometimes you can lose it. You don't always make a profit. Okay, so let's have a look now. That, that's sort of the model for uh, you know business techniques that they were used in the 14th, 15th century. Okay, and before that too. Effects of exploration and world commerce on Europe. The discovery of all water routes to the rest of the world tremendously increased the volume of Europe's trade during the Age of Transition. The, the, you know, we call this the Age of Transition, from the old world to the new one with the exploration. Many new products were introduced from Asia and were soon considered necessities of life. New spices to flavour food and preserved meat in an age before refrigeration. Various popular textiles like calico and ging gingham or jingham 
rugs, carpets, porcelain, tea, and coffee. Coffee became all the rage as well as tea. The New World also supplied items of food to change the diet of Europeans. For example, potatoes. Uh, before, the, before the exploration, there were no potatoes in Europe. Maize or corn. Tomatoes. Sugar. Cocoa. Great quantities of fish and tobacco. Mm. Tobacco. It started then. It doesn't stop. This new product stimulated new industries such as sugar refining, rum making and the manufacture of fur accessories. Overseas expansion also stimulated the demand for naval supplies and goods for settlers abroad. The European economy was even more directly affected by the influx of precious metals from the colonies. The tremendous quantities of gold and silver, chiefly from Spanish-controlled mines, more than tripled the amount of precious metals in Europe and thus completed a changeover from a, a barter or exchange economy to a money economy. This tremendous increase in money caused an accompanying rise in prices. Between 1500 and 1650, the cost of goods was tripled too. So in other words, the idea of inflation, you know, so that the people who make, uh, who make investments need a return. Without the inflation, uh, prices become static and the, the goods get old, get old. So you have to increase it. So th this is, uh, you know, this new business techniques and the exploration of world commerce on Europe. And welcome to Ginetta Russia. Welcome back from uh, America too. Okay, the European economy was even more directly affected by the influx of precious metals from the colonies. The tremendous quantities of gold and silver, chiefly from Spanish, I, was, I mentioned that just before. Uh, so we were at between 60, 1500 and 1650, the cost of goods was tripled too. That's in 150 years. Large-scale banking developed during the age of transition, first in Italy, from Florence, the Medici family, and later in the other parts of Europe. In the 14th century, there were 80 banking houses in Florence. Augsburg, London and Amsterdam became banking centres during this age. The 14th century, that's in 1300, it started then, but by the 14th century, by the 15th century, it was really quite developed, the banking system. Banks were important for facilitating financial transactions and accumulating capital for investment in commercial enterprises. The development of banking and joint stock companies gave rise to another modern institution, the stock exchange where people negotiated the exchange of shares of stock from one to another. Welcome to Donata di Masse, Bianco Fiore. Stock exchanges which made easy the purchase and sale of stocks and bonds came to be established in all the leading financial centres. Another new business institution was mutual insurance. So in other words, you, you, know, you, you invest in... Uh, like on a ship, let's say the, the ship goes down, return with the goods, you need some insurance. So insurance is a, a necessary evil, I say, because, you know, when you've got a big business or whatever, if you don't pay insurance and something goes wrong, you're really finished. Whereas the insurance money, but not everyone uh, is in that situation. Some people keep on paying insurance for a lifetime and don't ever call on it. So that's the nature of insurance. So it's, it's really like a, a Robin Hood type of uh, company because you take it from everyone and then when there's trouble somewhere else, that money gets given to those people in trouble. So, you know, we have to think about the value of insurance in those terms. Otherwise, they look like, you know, greedy companies that do nothing. <laughs> they have to be there. They, they really need to be honest about all this. Okay, so another new business institution was mutual insurance. 
a system whereby any financial loss was shared by all those who contributed to the insurance pool. Thus, for a certain sum, a merchant could insure a ship's safe return. His charge or premium was worked out on the basis of the percentage of vessels that had been lost on similar voyages. So it's on a large scale. So th that's basically it and, uh, for today. I'm going to stop there. And uh, we've looked at, you know, the business techniques that uh, were developed in, at this time and plus, of course, the, you know, the establishment of banks, companies, joint ventures and you name it. So that's uh, next time is all this activity, of course, brought in tremendous wealth to Europe and uh, uh, as a result, this national prosperity in those countries there that we just mentioned before, and they were the Spanish, the Dutch, the Portuguese, the English and the French. Of course, Italy was amongst these uh, the, these nations too, because it was occupied by the Spaniards, by the German, etc. The German economy too. They were occupied by different different tracts of land had different governments. And, you know, with Russia there on the, on the side. So there's a lot to this world history. Okay, so that's that for uh, exploration. Now, we're going to go, of course, to China. Okay, and th then afterwards we'll do for Africa. Now, in terms of China, I have here the relieving the generals of their commands at a feast, it's called. So I'm going to read this out because uh, China is a very interesting, uh, uh, very interesting history because it's quite removed from Europe altogether and it, it's, it's got its own momentum and its own, uh, it, its own uh, development. And they got there, by the way, in terms of civilization, uh, in some parts, in some areas, uh, a lot quicker than the Europeans. Yeah. And, uh, you know, anyone who's interested, Netflix has got some fantastic um, series, which I've, I've looked at, including the Mongols one, that, um, you know, became very powerful for about two, three hundred years. Uh, and they went as far as far uh, east, west, as far east to Budapest. West? No, as far west. <laughs> east and west. Where's west? Where's east? When you're talking, of course, we make mistakes. You don't always... Things don't always click. It's, it's, it's not because you don't know. It's because the nature of our brain, it's, you know, and as you get older, of course, the words start slipping and there's a lot more there that we need to look after. So it's very important to look after our bodies, but also our spirit and our emotional self is important. Uh, it's, you know, it's something that, um, of course, uh, Jeanette does a lot. Jeanette Russia puts a lot of her philosophies there um, on on Facebook, and I appreciate that. We, we've got quite a community on Facebook of people who know each other who are doing things, different things, and uh, it enriches all of us. Relieving the generals of their commands at a feast. After the downfall of the Tang dynasty, China entered a chaotic period of the five dynasties and ten kingdoms. So this, you know, the, the filmmakers, uh, historical filmmakers are very good uh, at doing this. Uh, let me see. Doesn't matter. In the later Zhu dynasty, 951 to 960. So we're talking about, you know, 600, 700 years before 500 years before uh, what we were talking about just before. Emperor Shizong let Zhao Kuangin control the military leadership. After Emperor Jinsong died, Shizong died, his young son succeeded to the throne. Taking this chance, Zhao Kuangin seized the imperial power 
and established the Song dynasty as Emperor Taizu. Not long after Zhao Guangin came to the throne, two local military governors revolted against the central authority. It took Zhao Guangin a lot of energy to suppress the revolt, which upset him very much. Once he talked with Zhao Pu, who had been with him for many years. He said that since the downfall of the Tang dynasty, there had, there had appeared many dynasties with endless wars. Numerous people had died. What was the reason for all this? Zhao Pu said the reason was very simple. The chaotic situation in a country lay in the scattering of the military power. The country would be restored to peace as soon as the military power was returned to the overall control of the central authority. Now, the governments do that now in every single nation. Emperor Taizu agreed with his opinion and it was by controlling the military leadership that he had seized the imperial power. Not only, not only, I will add, it's also the, the, the bureaucracy, control of the bureaucracy, the, the collecting of taxes and the distribution of the wealth according to government policy, according to the will of the, the emperor, who, yes, he had the power, the ultimate power, but they were always surrounded by uh, advisors. And if the advisor got it wrong, uh, they would be severely punished. In order to prevent the same thing from happening again, Emperor Taizu decided to take back military power from local authorities. In an autumn evening in 1961, that's after the birth of Christ, about around 1,000 years, Emperor Taizu held a banquet in the Imperial Palace and invited Shi Shu Xing and other senior generals. The Emperor held up the cup and said, but for your help, I wouldn't be what I am, like nowadays. But you don't know that it is very difficult being an emperor. In fact, it's happier being a local military governor than being an emperor. She shows Zin and the other generals were very surprised when they heard this and asked why. Emperor Taizu said, it is quite obvious, who does not want to be the emperor? The generals got the underlying meaning of his words and became flustered. They knelt on the ground hurriedly and said, we won't betray you at any time. Emperor Taizu shook his head and said, I have confidence in all of you, but I am afraid your subordinates may be ambitious and hanker after riches and honours. When they wrap, they wrap the yellow ground, gown, a symbol for emperor, around you and support you to be the emperor, can you refuse them? The generals were so frightened that their faces were covered with beads of perspiration. The next day they asked to resign and the emperor agreed immediately. He gave them a large amount of money and took back their military power. This was called relieving the generals of their commands at a feast in history. So the emperor said, so many wars because since the tank have gone, uh, we've created here all these different, uh, different dynasties, smaller ones, and then kingdoms here and there, uh, and people fighting amongst themselves all the time. Uh, you know, we're all Chinese anyway, sort of thing. So he's, I'll take control of the military and the bureaucracy, which is not mentioned here. Very important to, to, to do that. Okay, so that's, that's that. Now, I'm going to go to Africa. I need another drink. And we're going to go to Lesotho, which is a, a small state within South Africa. So... Here we go, here, I've got, uh, let's see if I can, yes, Lesotho, maybe I should, 
I should show it to you, but I don't have it here. Lesotho is in South Africa, it's a small country uh, surrounded by surrounded by South Africa. Lesotho, a high altitude landlocked kingdom and circled by South Africa, is crisscrossed by a network of rivers and mountain ranges, including the 3,482 metre high peak of Tabana Klanyana. On the Thaba Bosu Plateau, near Lesotho's capital, Maseru, are ruins dating from the 19th century reign of King uh, Moshushu, num Moshushu number one, uh, one uh, first. Thaba Bosu overlooks iconic Mount Kilauane, an enduring symbol of the nation's Basotho people. Okay, and then we're going to go and have a look at the history part. Okay, Lesotho, pronunciation is official, the Kingdom of Lesotho is a country landlocked as an enclave in South Africa. The only sovereign enclave in the world outside of the Italian peninsula, it is situated in the Maloti Mountains and contains the highest mountain in South Africa. The Italian one is San Marino, of course. It has an area of over 30,000 square kilometres, 11,600 square miles, and has a population of about 2 million, 3 million. I don't know how much they've got today. You have to look it up, okay? It was previously the British Crown Colony of Basuto Land, which was given independence by the United Kingdom on the 4th of October 1966, recently. It is a fully sovereign state and is a member of the United Nations, the Commonwealth of Nations, the African Union and the South, Southern African Development Community. The name Lesotho roughly translates to Land of the Soto. Uh, and there's more. I'm sort of, you know, looking this up, but there's a lot more there. The history part, let's have a look. Basuto land emerged as a single polity under King Moshushu in 1822. Moshushu, a son of Mokkashain, a minor chief of the Bakoteli lineage, formed his own clan and became a chief around 1804. Between 1820 and 1823, he and his followers settled at the Butha Buthi mountain, joining with former adversaries in resistance, in resistance against the Lifa Kain associated with the reign of Shaka Zulu from 1818 to 1828. Now, I've heard of Shaka Zulu, and again, you know, uh, on Netflix, the beautiful. Uh, Beautiful series relating to to Africa as well. One of them is the queen, you know, a woman, a queen who ruled particular lands. Further evolution of the state emerged from conflicts between British and Dutch colonists leaving the Cape Colony following its seizure from the French allied Dutch by. The, from the French and La Dutch by the British in, 19, in 1795, and also from the Orange River sovereignty, a subsequent Orange Free State. So whilst in 1795, whilst in France there was the, you know, the, the aftermath of the French Revolution, and, and then the upcoming of Napoleon Bonaparte. So uh, the English were more powerful then because there was a lot of problems in France. Missionaries Thomas Arbuset, Eugene Casalis and Constant Gosselin from the Paris Evangelical Missionary Society, invited by Moshi Moshi, the first were placed at Morija, develop, developing Sesotho orthography and printed works in the Sesotho language between 1837 and 1855. Now this language and culture goes well with uh, indigenous peoples too and the, unfortunately the writing uh, they, 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 a lot of them didn't have uh, the alphabet, their own alphabet etc so they relied on the alphabets of the Romans 
the one that we know, or the Greek one, or uh, I think it's basically the, the, the alphabet that we use ourselves now. Now, Casalis, acting as translator and providing advice on foreign affairs, helped set up diplomatic channels and acquire and acquire guns for use against the encroaching Europeans and the Greek people. Again, the military, you know, you, you need to defend yourself. Keep them out. <laughs> Tech Boas from Cape Colony arrived on the western borders of Bazuto land and claimed rights to its land, the first of which being Jan de Winar, who settled in the uh, Matla Kang area in 1838. Incoming Boas attempted to colonize the land between the two rivers and, and north of the Caledon, claiming that it had been abandoned by the Soto people. Moshi Moshi I subsequently signed a treaty with the British governor of the Cape Colony, Sir George Thomas Napier, Napier that annexed the Orange River sovereignty where Boas had settled. These outraged Boas were suppressed in a skirmish in 1848. In 1851, a British force was defeated by this Basoto army at Kolonyama. After repelling another British attack in 1852, Moshi Moshi sent an appeal to the British commander that settled the dispute diplomatically and then defeated the Batlokoa in 1853. In 1854, the British pulled out of the region and in 1958, Moshi Moshi fought a series of wars with the Boers in what is known as the Free State Basotho War. As a result, Moshi Moshi lost a portion of, of the Western Lowlands. The last war with the Boers ended in 1867 when Moshi Moshi appealed to Queen Victoria, who agreed to make Basuto land a British prote protectorate in 1868. Therefore, they had the, the run of the British army. Uh, for themselves. In 1869, the British signed a treaty of, at Aliwal, north with the, the Boers, that defined the boundaries of Basuto land. This treaty reduced Moshi Moshi's kingdom to half its previous size by ceding the Western territories. Then the British transferred functions from Moshi Moshi's capital in Thaba Bosu to a police camp on the northwest border, Maseru, until eventually the administration of Basuto land was transferred to the Cape Colony in 1871. Moshi Moshi died on the 11th of March 1870, marking the beginning of the colonial area of Basuto land in the Cape Colony period between 1871 and 1984. But Basuto land was treated similarly to other territories that had been forcibly annexed, much to the humiliation of the Basu, Basoto leading to the Basoto Gun War 1880-1881. In 1884, the territory became a crown colony by the name of Basuto Land with Maseru as its capital. It remained under direct rule by a governor while effective internal power was wielded by tribal chiefs. In, five, in 1905, a railway line was built to, the, to connect Maseru to the railway network of South Africa. Basuto land gained its independence from the United Kingdom and became the Kingdom of Lesotho in 1966. The Basotho National Party ruled from 1966 until January 1970. What later ensued was a de facto government led by Libao Jonathan. In January 1970, the ruling BNP lost the first post-independence general election with 23 seats to the Basotho Congress Party, BCP, 36. Prime Minister Jonathan refused to cede power to BCP, instead declaring himself Prime Minister and imprisoning the BCP leaders, leadership. BCP began a rebellion and then received training in Libya for its Lesotho Liberation Army under the pretense of being as then as Azanian People's Liberation Army, soldiers of Pan African, Africanist Congress, etc., etc., etc. Lesotho was later guerrilla launched and it kept going. So, if you want to look up Lesotho, there's a lot more uh, in the history there. Look it up online 
and find out about Lesotho. So we've got, uh, you know, I've got quite a bit to go now. So that's it for Africa today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, you know, my intention is to go from, uh, to really cover all of, of the continents and then, uh, you know, just making all us realise that history has been a hotbed of problems all along. But that's how progress is made, though. And we have uh, today in Australia, we're going to go to the polls to see whether, uh, you know, we, we want our Indigenous people to have uh, a voice, a voice. Will they be a parliament? I don't think so. But uh, I think all of the groups in Australia need to understand that uh, whether you've been here 60,000 years ago or arrived yesterday, we're part of small group different groups of people from different uh, parts of the world and we need to live in peace. The way to do it is to be very respectful towards each other and believe in the future because, uh, you know, if you stop people, th this argument here about Indigenous rights, etc., will go on forever and ever. Put a stop to it now. Vote yes. <laughs> See what happens. Uh, a lot of the legalistic people, of course, they are... Uh, they've got a self-interest to say, no, no, don't do it like that because we've got to discuss it some more and they can siphon off more money from the government uh, in various ways. So, you know, the trouble is, a, a, is good business in some ways. But that, that's it. Now, there's one more story that I want to read to you uh, from before the invasion. And I'm almost finished with this book here too. And this, the, the story that I'm going to read today is called The Flying Fox, retold by Muni Jal of the Butchula people of Fraser Island. There you are. And then we've got one last uh, chapter after this, yes, which will take us, oh no, quite long. Ooh, ooh. It'll be quite a, a number of, uh, will still be before the invasion, because after the invasion, you know what I'm going to do? The history of the colonials. And that's to bring some, the old world and the new world together. That's it. Okay, the flying fox. One day, as Yin Dingji, or yin, yin Dingi, whichever one, you know, it's a pronunciation. Yin Din Jie. Yin Dingi. Y I N D I N G I E. So that Gi or J or G. The spirit God, whom we sometimes call the rainbow, was teaching the birds how to build nests. One little chap kept getting in the way and wanting to be shown how to build a nest. Indingi said to him, you are a bat, not a bird. But, said the flying fox, I have wings and I can fly. Why can't I build a nest too? Then he kept on making a nuisance of himself till the Indingi became becoming angry, picked him up tied his feet together and hung him head down over a limb. <laughs> this made the others laugh. Flying foxes, you know, they don't have nests. They hang around. <laughs> now, when they had finished for the day, the Indingi came to him and said, Now, have you had enough? Perhaps that will teach you a lesson. Oh, no, said the flying fox. I like it here. I like looking at the world like this. I think it is nice. Then said the Indingi, you shall always hang like that. Then he bent the flying fox's toes around so that he could hang by them to the limbs. Of course, the flying fox was only pretending. He really just didn't want the other birds to know how much he had been humiliated. You never see him now until all the other birds have gone to sleep. And when he goes to sleep, in the daytime, he usually picks a hollow tree or a dark cave where no other birds can see him and laugh at him. 
It's beautiful, huh? Flying fox. So it's a form of bullying by the other birds because they're making fun of him. So he says, okay, I'm going to go into the dark. Nobody will see me. Uh, you live, you, you, you know, fly wherever you want and I will do what I have to do. Okay. So that's, that's a flying fox. Next time we're going to look at the cave art and paintings, etc. Sort of, um, they are the, you know, the way that the, the history is told in the indigenous populations. Okay, now we have our dear friend Banjo Patterson. And Banjo Patterson, of course, uh, knew about the Boer War. Ah, the Lesotho. Because this next poem, I, I didn't do it on purpose, I just, it just came here, right in front of the army. So in other words, when soldiers come back, even if they haven't fought, they of course they fought. You can't be a soldier if you haven't fought. This is called right in front of the army. Where have you been this week or more? I haven't seen you about the war. Thought perhaps you was at the rear, guarding the wagons. What, us? No fear. Where have we been? Why, well, bless my heart. Where have we been since the blooming start? Right in front of the army, battling day and night. Right in the front of the army, teaching them how to fight. Every separate man you see, Sapa, Ghana and CIV, every one of them seems to be right in the front of the army. The irony, you know, everyone is, has been fighting and they need medals for their efforts. Most of the troops to the camp had gone when we met with a cow gun toiling on and we said to the boys as they walked their past, well, thank goodness you are here at last. Here at last? Why? What do you mean? Ain't we just where we've always been? Right in the front of the army, battling day and night. Right in the front of the army, teaching them how to fight. Correspondents and vets in force, mounted foot and dismounted horse. All of them were, as a matter of course, right in the front of the army. Well... Wow. Old Lord Roberts will have to mind if ever the enemy get behind, for they'll smash him up with a rear attack because his army has got no back. <laughs> They're all in the front of the army. Think of the horrors that might befall an army without any rear at all. <laughs> right in the front of the army, battling day and night, right in the front of the army, teaching them how to fight. Swede attaches and German counts, yeomen known as the, their wet remounts, all of them were by their own accounts right in the front of the army. So there you are, whoever they are, they're right in front of the army. That's what they do, they go in front of the army when. Interesting. Okay, well, that's our friend Benjamin Patterson. There's another friend of ours called, of course, none other than Henry Lawson. Henry Lawson, short story extraordinaire writer. Short story writer extraordinaire. Maybe that's better. Okay, we did the first page last week of An Old Mate of Your Father's. Now I'm going to read one page, see what happens. Sometimes the old mate would stay over Sunday and in the forenoon or after dinner, he and father would take a walk amongst the deserted shafts of Sapling Gully or along Quartz Ridge and criticise old ground and talk of past diggers' mistakes and second bottoms and feelers and dips and leads, also outcrops and absently pick up pieces of quartz and slate, rub them on their sleeves, look at them in an abstracted manner and drop them again and they would talk of some old lead they had worked on, 
the old lead they had worked on. Hogan's party was here on one side of us. McIntosh was here on the other. Mac was getting good gold and so was Hogan. And now why the blanky blank weren't we on, on gold? And the mate would always agree that there was gold in them ridges and gullies. Yet if a man only had the money behind to get it at it, and then perhaps the governess would show him a good spot where he intended to put down a shaft some day. The old man was always thinking of putting down a shaft. And these two old 59ers would mooch around and uh, sit on their heels on the sunny mullock hips and break clay lumps between their hands and lay plans for the putting down of shafts and smoke till an urchin was sent to look for his father and Mr. So-and-so and and tell them to come to their dinner. (laughs) Poor miners, of course, dreaming, uh, dreaming of putting down a shaft to chase the gold in a bigger way. Like, you know, you got nothing, so you want a big supermarket uh, that will make your life easier sort of thing. Making money yeah, the easy way. But in, in your mind, you can do lots of things. Then practice, it's all different. And again, mostly in the fresh of the morning, they would hang about the fences out on the selection and review their livestock. Five dusty skeletons of cows, <laughs> a hollow sided calf or two, and one shocking piece of equine scenery. One pig, which, by the way, the old mate always praised, but the selector's heart was not in farming nor on selections. It was far away with the last new rush in Western Australia or Queensland, or perhaps buried in the worked out grounds of Tambarura, Married Men's Creek, or Ararwen, and by and by the memory of some half forgotten uh, reef to or lead or last chance. Nil, desperan- nil desperandum or brown snake claim would take their thoughts far back and away from the dusty, the dusty patch of sods and struggling sprouts called the crop, or the new discar- or the the few discouraged half dead slips which comprised the orchard. Then their conversation would be pointed with many golden points. Balkery Hills, Deep Creek, Maitland Bars, Specimen Flats and Chinaman's Gullies. And so they'd yarn till the younger came to tell them that mother says the breakfast is getting cold. And then the old mate would rouse himself and stretch and say, well, we mustn't keep the missus waiting, Tom. Well, we'll stop there. It's wonderful, huh? They're good, these people here. Let me see. There. So next time we'll continue. Then they've got to go for breakfast now. I can see I'm having fun. Uh, it's uh, 4.55. I've got 10 minutes uh, to show you my trip to Western Australia. We are in the, uh, near Broome. But you have to be patient now because I have to get my my things back here. Come on. Let's see. If I get it right, I'll pat myself on the back. Here. Go. Yes. <laughs> Happy. Good. Okay. Last week... We were here. There, I was in the in the bus, looking on. There you are. Oh my God! Uh, sorry, I have to sign in. Oh, what can you do? That's life, huh? It's okay because it works. All this is quite automatic now. Very lucky progress. It's called. 
And I thought that iCloud was in the clouds, but it's not true at all. They're just machines. <laughs> They're just machines. Don't tell me, oh no, I've got to go back. Oh no, but I worked out how to do it. Uh, well, I have to I have to work it out. So I've got to go back to around here. Uh, no, again. Uh, unbelievable. Doesn't matter because you know these are the problems that you encounter when you're doing this sort of work. We've done well today, though. I'm trying to, to do things quickly, and then every time I try to do it quickly, what happens is that uh, the, these, uh, these machines don't agree with me. <laughs> Never mind. It's okay. We'll get there. Be patient. Don't forget that you can, uh, you know, send some recognition to me and say, Tom, we're watching. Okay. Oh, not again. Not again. It's the third time I have to go in into iCloud. Third time. Unbelievable. I'm going to take it easy now. Doesn't matter. Take. I've got everything right, and then this happens. Never mind. Well, have you travelled yourselves around Australia? Do you have, you know, you can uh, show us where you've been. All your friends are here. Okay, I'm going to be very nice now and just do it nicely. I'm waiting. Okay, if I can get to this... Uh, good. Okay. Oh, got to go down. I'm taking it easy because I need to, you know, to to get to the to where I'm supposed to be. Okay, so just a little bit here. March, yes, uh, we'll get there. It's all right. Yes, just a bit more. Bye. One bit more. Yes, we are there. And I'm not going to risk it anymore. <laughs> Uh, uh, down, 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 yes. Gosh, unbelievable. It's supposed to be July 18. So you've got to go up and down until you find the right spot. Doing it. Ba -da 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 ah, dear, dear, dear. Patience. Patience, patience. Huh? 
patience. <laughs> oh, come on. So I've shown you this one's the, the other parts too. So if you go to insenia.com and you go to the um, to the blog section and you look up my uh, my podcast one to sixty, and this one here is sixty seven. So we're going to together. Mamma mia! I didn't realize there was so much before the 18th, come on. Oh, yes. 18, yes. Now we're talking. I remember you. <laughs> yes. Oh, yes. No. I'm having problems, really having problems going up or down. 15, no, we've got 18. Come on. Yes, come on. We are together, we are together. La -da -da -dee, da -da 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 -da. It's called Water Bank. Once it comes on, should be all right this time. Here it is. Finally, well, if you're still there, <laughs> I'll show you the rest. Okay, come on. There we are. On our way. Water bank. That's part of now we're going, uh, we're going on an excursion here. Look at this, how beautiful it is, sir. I can't remember the excursion. It's called Water Bank. Get in there. Slowly but surely. It's Australia for you. Really quick. Pearls. We're going for pearls. Really quick pearl farm. Can I have some fun here? Pearls. Well, I'll, show, I'll just show you the pearls. Really quick pearl farm. Beautiful, huh? In the middle of nowhere, you get this wonderful place. That's Australia for you. Really quick pearls. You'll be able to see quite a lot how you how they get the pearls and the nice looking grounds, well kept. I don't know if I'm going too fast or too slow, but, you know, be patient. There we are. Lovely areas. Just a memory of me. That's a nice photo. You need the selfies, otherwise, you, you know, it's like you know, haven't been there. Beautiful. Huh? 
As I said, it's in the middle of nowhere, but it's got everything. A crocodile. There. Your dear friend, a croc. The pearls, shells. All the people who visit, these are the pearls, big big ones. They cost a lot of money. My God. This is how they make them. Cleopatra. She liked her pearls. Choosing your pearl. Colours of the pearls, different colours. Anatomy of an oyster. That's where the pearls come from. Pearl Harbor there. That's where they, they are. I'm not even sure whether the pictures are... I suppose to turn them around, I suppose. Olivia Newton John. Oh. Very nice. Don Pearl. Marine Biomedical. This is the actual um, place where they. You know, refined the products. Welcome. The Pintada Maxima. She was very good, the presenter. Was the bit of education about the pearls. Mother Pearl. Willy Creek Pearls is a collaborative partner with a new broom based biotech company, Marine Biomedical Pity Wild. Uh, there you are. Well, I'll get to the end of this. Where do our oysters come from? Life cycle. Virgin seedlings. There we are. Great memory. And I think we, I can't remember, I think we go for an, the excursion here on the river. Yes, so the pearls outside. Here we go. Yes, or we're going home. I'm not quite sure. No. Yeah. I'll stop there. Okay, because we're going in. I think I went in first. Okay, so let's have a look where we are. There we are, here. That's the, this one here. Okay, we'll continue next time. Uh, next time I have uh, you again. And this is uh, Sunday, the 9th of, um, of July, 2023. And, uh, yeah, Program 67 is over. Thank you very much for your company. I hope that a lot of people come, you know, come and uh, watch Program 67 and are patient with me when I've had problems with this, but never mind, next time, okay?